the annual meeting is a time when the New Haven Preservation Trust focuses on really salient and current issues of urban life in New Haven. But this year we go a little bit farther afield in that, in truth, New Haven, perhaps in New England, maybe in the country, our speaker will be able to talk about this, is in the throes of changing its identity back to what it once was, which was a place where people lived and could walk to work. And that's the whole point of our speaker's book, Street Design. The idea that we are an automotive world, not because we thought about it a long time, it just sort of happened, and it transmogrified many places into places that we want to change. So there's no better person, I think, in the world to talk about walkable cities than John Massengale, who did his undergraduate work at Harvard and then got his architecture degree at Penn and is a licensed architect in the state of New York and has received awards from Progressive Architecture Magazine, Metropolitan Home, and was part of a National Book Award nomination for the amazing book, New York 1900, one of my favorite books ever. And he has also uh, taught at Notre Dame, at the University of Miami, at the Institute of Classical Architecture, and has lectured everywhere. And if I'm not mistaken, John, correct me if I'm wrong, was seminal in the creation of, the, of CNU. And, and maybe you talk a little bit about that, which is a group that really has put the focus of the world on our cities prior to the cachet and coolness of the recent sustainability green cities kind of uh, world, which has been around for 30 years. And one of our great friends here, Robert Orr, was also part of creating that. And so tonight we have a person who is visionary, has thought about things that are so much in our future that they're deeply embedded in our past. That kind of breadth and thoughtfulness of consideration is the way I think this country and the world will see itself through a very big change time. And without further ado, I'd like you to greet John Massingale. Uh, thank you, Duo, and thank you to the, to the Trust, especially for inviting me here on this incredible day. What a day to walk around New Haven. You know? um, so let's start. So once upon a time, New Haven looked like this. And uh, this is Chapel Street looking west towards the green, maybe in 1870. But before we start, I have a question for you. What's the first thing you see when you visit an historic district in a modern city? And the answer is, we see streets dominated by cars and trucks. But what if we treated historic districts historically, making the cars accommodate the city rather than the other way around? This is a similar view of Chapel Street taken a few years later, after cars became common, but before Henry Ford put the Model T into mass production. Both photos show Chapel Street, and in both photos you notice that most of the people are over on the sidewalk. But notice how many are also just out in the street. And I'm also going to ask you what's not in the photo. And the answer to that is stoplights, stop signs, traffic signs, crosswalks, painted lanes, and all the other things that define our, our modern streets. So why does this matter? Well, as the great Jane Jacobs said, streets and their sidewalks, the main public places of a city, are its most vital organs. Think of a city and what comes to mind. It's streets. If a city's streets look interesting, the city looks interesting. If they look dull, the city looks dull. And here's another quote uh, by a friend of mine, James, Coward, James Howard Kunstler. These streets had many purposes beyond what we now call transportation and mobility, which is about the only way cities talk about them most of the time. Uh, and they were also, in the past, they were where a lot of public life took place. And one of the reasons Jane Jacobs wrote her great book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, was be because the planning profession was producing what Jane called urban removal. 
And as, as I say under the, under the photo, we made the space between the buildings pretty big there for a while. And even, it wasn't only out on the periphery. Uh, uh, perhaps an uh, unreliable source here told me that New Haven chopped 17 feet off the, off the green to make Chapel Street wider here. And, uh, you know, the green, at least to me, the green is the historic heart of the city. So it seems strange to cut it down so the cars can more easily drive in and out. And of course, when it came where to live, more went out than in. In other words, yes, what goes on in the space between the buildings matters in the historical city and in any city where we want to reclaim life before urban removal. This is the historic center of Greenwich Village in New York City, where I'm from. It's now what they call an auto sewer with highway scale graphics on the street that you can read at 65 miles per hour. <laughs> and here's a quick sketch my office made for Jane Jacobs Square. Uh, Jane lived just a few blocks away on Hudson Street. I'll, I'm going to talk about this later. But first, a little about me. I was born in New York. I grew up in Darien. And when I was growing up, Connecticut was still a state of walkable towns and cities. I'm not quite as old as this picture, but if you add newer cars to the photo, this is the New Canaan I knew growing up. The main street had a train station and was where all the stores were. Uh, Darien's downtown wasn't as beautiful, but it was walkable, and my mother didn't expect to drive me anywhere. Most of the time, I walked or rode my bike. As I grew up, I loved the architecture of Connecticut and New England. And I was lucky to have a grandmother who actually gave me books like Kelly's Early Domestic Architecture of Connecticut and also took me on trips to see buildings and towns, including, uh, including houses for, uh, from Kelly's book. She herself lived in Maine in a classic big house, little house, back house barn. And I haven't seen her house since 1963, but I still remember it very well inside and out. Now at that time, 11 was the age when Darien kids were allowed to ride the train into New York City, where I luckily arrived in Grand Central. Obviously, I wasn't in Darien anymore. And this was exactly the time when New York's other great station, McKinney and White's Penn Station, was threatened with demolition which of course was the act that started historic preservation in New York City. Uh, in this photo, you can see Philip Johnson, Jane Jacobs, and others trying to prevent that. And I can't say I was there, but, but I, I knew about this. Even though this was outside the area around Grand Central where I was allowed to walk when I was 11, because my parents would talk about these things around the dinner table and what John Lindsay was doing with the city and that sort of thing. And, uh, and this was the time when people like Jane Jacobs were starting a public debate about cities, how we built them and why we needed them. Now there is an interesting psychotherapist named James Hillman who lived in Thompson, Connecticut, who started an urban institute in the 1970s. And as you can see here, he wrote a book called We've Had a Hundred Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. <laughs> Hillman worked in the field of archetypal psychology, which was both classical and Jungian, like Hillman. There's a classical and Jungian belief that it's around the time you're 11, the time when I was walking around New York and visiting New England with my grandmother, that you often get an idea about what you want to do with your life. For example, Hillman tells the story of Frank Lloyd Wright and his Frobo blocks, which young Frank's mother gave him. Uh, she said Frank became an architect because she gave him Frobo blocks, which Friedrich Frobo, the inventor of the kindergarten, called the first educational toy. But in archetypal theory, Frank's mother wisely gave him Frobo blocks because he was an architect. So what did Frank do with his Frobo blocks? I can see it, a duo already knows. Here's, here's one of his first public buildings <laughs> when he grew up. By the way, uh, this is the Unity Temple. By the way, Wright was once discussing design with a young architect who was very excited about his first building and how great it was. And, yes, we all do God's work, Wright said, 
You and your way and me and his. <laughs> and here are some of the things I did when I grew up. While I was in architecture school, I went to work for Robert Ames Stern for the summer and stayed for five years. One thing we did during those five years was write this book, New York 1900. Uh, that was after we wrote this short book, The Anglo-American Suburb, and which I used for my graduate thesis when I went back to get my Master's of Architecture degree. It was a subway suburb for the South Bronx at a time when the Bronx was burning and a member of the New York Times editorial board wrote a Sunday Magazine article saying that New York City should turn off all services to large parts of the South Bronx and just let it go fallow. I chose a site with two subway stops next to Robert Moses's Cross Bronx Expressway, which was part of the reason, the highway, which was part of the reason the Bronx was burning. I planned a railroad station and a mixed use downtown <coughs> on the Metro North tracks that also went through the site and designed a, a place much like Forest Hills Gardens in Queens. That was another subway suburb that also had a train station built by the Russell Page Foundation in the 1920s as a model town. Uh, and it, it's something we wrote about in the Anglo-American suburb and uh, later in New York 1900. Here's a, here's a close-up. Uh, I think you can see which part of it was my design. Uh, I had to design something like 27 building types to go along with it. Here's one of the little houses out near the periphery. Uh, Alan Plattis is here tonight. He'll recognize some of the influences in this drawing. And there's an interesting story about here about Ed Logue, uh, the same urban removal expert who worked in New Haven, who later broke New York City when his Urban Development Corporation defaulted on the city's Big Mac bonds. Uh, maybe we'll have time for that at the end of the presentation. While I was writing the Anglo-American suburb with Bob, he sent me to meet Andres Duany and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, who had information about one of the places we were writing about in the book. Later, while I was designing my thesis, at the same time, unknown to me, they were designing Seaside, Florida. Kurt Anderson presciently wrote in Time magazine that Seaside was, quote, one of the most influential projects of the decade and hopefully decades to come, which turned out to be true. I was lucky enough to be town architect there in 1986. And while I was at Seaside, I was lucky enough to meet New Haven architect Robert Orr, who's here tonight, who designed some of the best early work at Seaside. Years later, I designed this transit-oriented brownfield development in Connecticut with Robert. That land was sold to the Trust for Public Land and is now a town park. But this transit-oriented infill development, also on Long Island Sound and also designed with Robert Orr, was built in Southport, Connecticut, between the train station and 95, which you can just, you can see the, the railroad in the, in the background in 95 on the right. Uh, today it looks like this and this. And more recently I wrote this book, which came out in 2014. Uh, in a nutshell, it talked about how to get back to making streets that honor the public realm. That obviously contrasts with the way we built in the 20th century. Particularly after World War II, these new streets that were supposed to be more efficient for moving traffic were invented. There were only four types the freeway, the arterial, the collector, and local roads. You can see in the diagram that the highest level of service is free-flowing traffic. That's the, the yellow, mobility. Uh, so at the top of the hierarchy is the freeway, which has limited access. And next in line is the arterial road, which uh, has limited curb cuts, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. And uh, services like shopping centers and office parks share access roads or on service roads next to the arterials. Collectors have office, retail, and residential. Uh, the more there is, the slower the roads become. And then finally, local roads are frequently dead-end uh, subdivision streets. Now in this diagram, I'm, I'm quickly explaining this because many of us in the, north, in the Northeast don't understand modern planning in its pure form 
because we have so many old cities and towns and not a lot of empty land for development near centers of population. Uh, we saw urban removal at work, but we didn't see how modern planning worked in, in its purest form on thousands of acres of land. But in places like California, you can see how modern planning reinvented what are called land use. So at the top is the traditional neighborhood. Uh, you see in the center are, are uh, stores, offices, um, often apartments above. And um, everything is, is walkable because, of course, it was invented before the car, so it had to be walkable. In between uh, on, is the collector road, and on the other side of the collector road, you have modern, uh, modern planning, which you can see uh, is, is clustered, and you get, for example, one type of row house will get, will get a, an exit off the road. A different type of single family house will get an exit for its subdivision, and uh, of course the mall gets its its uh, its own exit and uh, I don't have a pointer but if you imagine that the mall is the is the biggest object there in the bottom and if you imagine uh, one of the houses just below it if somebody in that house wants to go to the mall they have to get in their car because there's a fence between the mall and the and the house so they have to get in their car drive out to the drive out to the next road drive out drive out drive out drive out Drive to the collector, drive in, uh, you know, drive over to where you park. Uh, there's no parking there that day, so you have to move again. And uh, you know, it's a it's a system that, on its own, um, it's obvious why we liked it in the beginning. But when you have a system where everybody has to drive everywhere for everything, you cannot build enough roads. They inevitably reach a point of failure and traffic jam. And um, Nevertheless, we continue to this day with the functional classification service, uh, functional classification funding, which defines level of service by traffic flow, not what's actually flowing, but uh, you know, it's not the freeway during the traffic jam, it's just the freeway. And it's called LOS. Uh, and on the top for the book, we came up with what we called the walkable index number or win. So we had loss versus win. <laughs> and to reclaim the public realm, we looked at historic streets and analyzed their use. And we proposed what we called 11 essential street types for reclaiming cities from domination by the car. And then we looked at them in different categories. Uh, for example, historic streets. And I have to emphasize that there is no good city street in the world that gets a good grade from the federal level of service standards that are used for functional classification. Because moving vehicles and making places where people want to be are fundamentally at odds. In fact, the streets with the best grades in the level of service have no people allowed near the streets. Even trees are a problem. Trees are called fixed hazardous objects or FHOs. <laughs> and people are MHOs, moving hazardous objects. <laughs> Now, the street on the left is the Rambla, La Rambla in Barcelona. In English, Ramblas are promenades, places where people can walk in the center of the street. Barcelona has many Ramblas, but this is La Rambla, the biggest and widest, which goes from the center of Barcelona to the sea. It is the heart of public life in Barcelona. Two narrow traffic lanes on each side uh, allow deliveries and the like. Federal funding standards would make this an F minus. And you can see that moving hazardous objects and fixed hazardous objects are welcome. So here's Main Street in Nantucket, one of the great streets of America. Uh, I could talk about this street alone for an entire night. This Nantucket sidewalk is on the right in the previous view. And as you can see, it's a place where people want to be. We, say, we said in the beginning of street design that a space is not a place unless there are people there. It's not hard to make these places. They have to be comfortable, safe, interesting, and part of a network of streets in which one can walk from place to place. Interesting can have many aspects. Beauty is interesting, and we know that people like to walk in beautiful places like 
St. Mark's Place in Venice and the left bank of Paris. In the 21st century, shops are one way we make places where people want to be. An interesting new study, study shows that people talking on a sidewalk will stand in front of an attractive storefront rather than a blank wall, even if their backs are to the storefront. But Amazon is challenging the ability of bricks and mortars to stay in business. Of course, in addition to examples of streets, we talked about street design principles, like uh, the principle illustrated here, which is what's called the terminated vista, using important buildings to break up long, boring streets. In Paris, they love the terminated vista. Without too much work, you can see about 10 of them in this photo. As I said, when making a place where people want to get out of their cars and walk, you need a network of walkable streets, and people like Jane Jacobs have reminded us that we need things like short blocks. Many cities are removing highways. New Haven needs to do more of this, in my opinion. As we do more of this, we have the opportunity to take the empty land where the highway was and make great places like Regent Street. Regent Street was built by a regent who needed money. His father, Mad King George, was still alive. And this was a redevelopment scheme for medieval London to connect fashionable London, where his palace was on the right, to his land to the north, now called Regent's Park. It looks like this, as you may know. And it connects to the old medieval fabric, uh, crossing it in, in fantastic ways like this. Uh, we showed other types of retrofitted streets. This is a design we call the Yorkville Promenade for 2nd Avenue in New York, and uh, I'll come back to it. What do you do with streets like this, which dominate the American landscape? In cities, one solution is to make them boulevards and avenues like the Paseo de Gracia in Spain. We also showed at, in the book several examples of urbanizing wide suburban transportation corridors and uh, making them new town centers. Here's the Avenue Diana in Paris, which has six lanes of parking, moves cars well, and is also a good place for walking. Slow cars go along the outside near the pedestrians, uh, which, which is how you get three of the lanes of parking, and while faster cars go in the middle. An important issue today is making it possible for people to get out of their cars and to use bicycles, scooters, and the like. So far in America, we're building some functional bike lanes, but we travel to Paris to see beautiful streets like this which is also a more interesting place to ride a bike than any bike lane in America that I've seen. German bike lanes frequently look like this. All European cities rely less on car travel, provide alternatives, and have much lower traffic death rates than we have here, and of course much lower carbon footprints. But Americans' growing use of bikes were one of the reasons why Victor and I wrote this book. Americans are increasingly coming to realize that for much of the last century we've been building transportation corridors rather than places for people. And we're getting more interested in making places for pedestrians and cyclists. This picture was taken on one of the three days every year when this street near my old office looks like this. But in this photo of the same street, the other 362 days of the year, we can see that while there's been a revolution, the evolution of the revolution is slow, and not all the current responses are equally good. New York City held a competition to design the 21st century street, and all the entries look like this. This particular one was designed by a bike specialist, who like most specialists wanted to make his specialty special. <laughs> so you have this colored bike lane dynamically weaving in front of the cars, which, which is very dangerous for the cyclists. The street has five colors of paint and lots of stripes at the intersection, which is where the traffic engineers focus, because that's where cars hit each other. <laughs> but look at the side of the street. The sidewalks, where city life takes place, are empty and not even thought about. The buildings that define the public realm are blank. 
The great traffic engineer Hans Mondermann, whom, whom I'll come back to in a minute, said, the trouble with traffic engineers is, when there's a, is that when there's a problem with a road, they always try to add something. That's what specialists do at the expense of the whole. While we were writing street design, we looked at great streets all around the world, and I can tell you that none of them have lots of paint like this. <laughs> What's important in a street for people is the harmony of the whole, not the color of the pavement. All this visual busyness cuts the street into pieces, cutting one side off from the other, harming the whole, and claiming the center for machines. To find out how we got here, it helps to look back at the recent history of city streets. Since I'm from New York, and I write about New York, I'm going to talk about New York. This is an aerial view looking south at the intersection of Fifth Avenue and Broadway. One result of that intersection was the famous Flatiron Building, designed by the famous city planner Daniel Burnham. Another result that you see in the foreground was the widest intersection in New York City. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's something like 137 feet wide. But when you look closely, you see that just like in New Haven at the time, there are all sorts of things going on in the space between the buildings. Cable cars are there, um, actual cable cars being pulled by cables. Uh, people st are standing in the, street, in the street waiting for the cable cars. People are standing in the street talking. People are crossing the street. You can see a few cars and, uh, and some horse-drawn wagons. Nobody um, in the street looks like they feel like they're in the wrong place. Looking in the opposite direction, you see Madison Square and in the distance, the old Madison Square Garden, the second greatest lost building in the history of New York, also designed by Kim, McKim, Mead and White. You also see people using the space like a piazza and the temporary monument called the Dewey Arch, built to commemorate the Spanish-American War. It sits in the middle of the street because that's what we did then. The Washington Square Arch also originally sat in the middle of Fifth Avenue, just north of the square. Built in plaster commemorated the centennial of George Washington's New York inauguration as President of the United States. Here's a view of Broadway nine years later, shot from the front of one of the cable cars. It begins underneath the elevated subway and runs north along the exact same stretch of Broadway. That's the New York built, Herald building on the right. In the photograph I just showed, and in this film clip, you can see there are no stoplights stop signs, traffic signs, or striping anywhere on the road. Most of the pedestrians do stay over on the sidewalk, but you can see then what was called organized motordom hadn't yet invented the term jaywalking or made it a legal offense in cities across the country. Let's, here we go. Um, so I mentioned organized motordom. Organized motordom was the self-selected name of a group of car companies, oil companies, and the like that wanted to sell cars. They realized that in order to sell more cars, it had to be easy for cars to move around. And one year after the Ford Model T went into mass production, they were widening what the New York Times was suddenly calling New York's greatest driveway. The year before, the sidewalks had been wider than the roadbed. But in 1909, New York City reversed that, giving the car more of the street, even though there were obviously more pedestrians than cars. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that the, the artists of this rendering reduced the number of pedestrians. And so we are off to the races. For the next 100 years, we gave more and more space and importance to the automobile in the city at the expense of the pedestrian. The space between the buildings had been where public life took place, but now the space between the sidewalks became, became transportation corridors. And the job of the new profession of the traffic engineer was to make the traffic flow as smoothly and quickly as water in a pipe. Over time, a lot of those pipes became what we call auto sewers, particularly new roads built in the suburbs without sidewalks. But a lot of the same suburban style design Philosophies were brought into city streets, even Manhattan streets, where 80% of the residents don't own cars. Uh, Manhattan and the outer boroughs got many suburban-style arterials designed to get suburbanites quickly and easily in and out of the city. Many of these are also 
the roads where the most fatalities take place because the engineers successfully used techniques like wider traffic lanes and one-way streets to make the traffic flow faster. And on city streets, you could not make the separation of cars and people. What? I'm sorry, I've got ahead of myself here. We're going to get to Vision Zero, which, which talks about the separation of people. But if you look at, as preservationists, if you look at this, a couple of things to notice. One, the, the sidewalk is even narrower or even more cut back than you think because they've knocked the stoops off the buildings. And not only knocked the stoops off, they also cut the trim off. And uh, these were actually historic buildings built by the Rhinelander family, very good row houses designed by the architect of the Plaza Hotel. And um, undoubtedly, when this auto sewer came along, they just got in their cars and drove out to Long Island. So that when Andy Warhol came along as a starving artist, uh, he was able to afford one of the houses in this shot. And so here's another video, an excerpt from the Broadway Follies of 1928 with Harold Lloyd and a guest appearance by Babe Ruth. This is the same stretch of Broadway we saw before. There's the New York Herald building in the middle. Watch what happened to the space between the buildings. There's, oh, there's supposed to be music here, but it's not on. Does anyone know how to turn this, this on? Lights on. Silent film. Yeah, but there's something coming up where I'm going to miss the music if it's not there. You're also missing all the honking. There's paper. There we go. So, in 10 years, the public realm changed a lot. But now we're, we're, we are in a new phase. When, uh, when it comes to streets for people, we have both the good and the bad now. The same DOT that made the 21st century streets also made places like this. Mayor Bloomberg's DOT commissioner, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, made this intervention in, intervention in Madison Square at that widest intersection. There's the, uh, the Flatiron building in the background. Um, being the DOT commissioner, she realized she could do whatever she wanted with the streets. <laughs> Which reminds me, what's the difference between a DOT and a terrorist organization? <laughs> you can negotiate with a terrorist organization. <laughs> so Jeanette sent trucks there overnight and when people showed up in the morning, literally half the street was gone and there were now people sitting in the middle of the street. <laughs> and because, as I mentioned, 80% of all Manhattan households don't own a car, New Yorkers love this. Uh, this, is what, this is the Vision Zero I mentioned. Mayor de Blasio's DOT commissioner introduced Vision Zero, which is a promise to reduce traffic deaths to zero within a fixed number of years. Vision Zero correctly says there are only two ways to move to zero traffic deaths. Either separate the people from the cars, which is what functional classification did, or slow the cars way down uh, to, to what we've now learned is uh, below 20 miles per hour. 20 miles per hour is sort of the, the magic number at which you hit fewer people and you don't kill them if you hit them. Uh, uh, In, and, and I've got to add that functional classification was about making it safer for cars to go faster. But safe was in the context of 38,000 traffic fatalities last year in the United States. In Amsterdam, there's, they're slowing cars down to the next level and they are way ahead of us in safety. One of our first trips for the book was to Amsterdam where we stayed in the house on the right uh, by the bicycle. And I've got to say, it's just a little urban paradise. There are 
many reasons to go visit the streets of Amsterdam and the Netherlands, including the fact that over 50 years ago, the citizens of Amsterdam decided that they didn't like what cars were doing to their streets and lives. And they had a, they had a turning point when several children were killed uh, by cars and they started a movement, the name of the movement, the English translation of the movement being Stop the Child Murder. And now in New York, it's, it's coming, the, there's a group called um, uh, Save the Families. And in order to be a member of this group, you have to have a family member who was killed in a traffic. And they too, uh, uh, of course, are being very successful. Uh, now the concept in Amsterdam is called shared space, and this is something Hans Mondermann helped to invent. Uh, in 85% of the streets in Amsterdam, as in the one you see here, uh, they took out all the detritus of the traffic engineer. So they're going back to no traffic signs, no paint, no stoplights, etc. And when you get to the intersection, the cyclist and the pedestrian of the car all have to sort of look at each other and negotiate who goes through. And of course, the most vulnerable and the slowest is the pedestrian. So the pedestrian becomes the king in instead of the car. So how do we apply that to historic districts in American cities? This is a, a satellite view of that space, the, the old center of Greenwich Village, where old street, get, street grids that came along before the Manhattan grid of today come together at different angles, uh, leaving this really perfectly scaled place. So we, did, we made a design for people for the historic center, and as I said, we called it Jane Jacobs Square, uh, in honor of the great urbanist who lived just a few blocks, a few blocks away. Uh, here's another view looking south on Bleecker, and here's a, a quick sketch my office did for, for Jane Jacobs Square. Uh, Jane said endless vistas, the opposite of the Terminator Vista, sucked all the energy out of the street for pedestrians, and she recommended regular interventions. Cars can go through, but they have to go slowly. Here's another view of the Yorkville Promenade a different type of solution. We designed this when uh, Second Avenue was dug up for the construction of the Second Avenue subway, because one thing you always hear when you talk about redesigning streets is we can't afford that. You know, we have our road system, if you put together all the roads, the functional classification, the highway, it is the most expensive public works in the history of the world, and yet, you know, it's, it's gold-plated, it was always done to exacting engineering standards, but we can't afford to do anything to it. But Second Avenue is all dug, was all dug up for the subway. Uh, so, that, so that's why we threw this idea out here. Before construction, it looked like this. It's one of the main restaurant streets of the Upper East Side, and people pay a lot of money to eat here right next to the trucks. On the way here this morning, I, I took this photo. I didn't realize that cyclists had stopped between me and the outdoor tables at this really very good restaurant. Uh, but you, so you can't see the tables very well, but you can imagine. And yes, it's very unhealthy to eat next to four lanes of constantly moving traffic. Uh, here's the section across the Yorkville Promenade with a 46 foot public space in the middle, two, uh, two parking lanes and two very narrow lanes on each side, uh, wider sidewalks. And in, in Barcelona, this would be a place where with no problem, uh, waiters would go in and out and take food out to the center. And of course, someone will say, but we're not Barcelona. Uh, you know, if you go to Copenhagen and you see what they've done and you see the public life, that they have today, you, you have to know that uh, when they started to do it, people said, but we're not Italians, <laughs> we're Danes. And now they have some of the greatest public life of any city in the world. Another type of solution for a place where there are lots of cars, um, is something like 65% of all the traffic deaths in New York happen on 15% of the roads. 
Queens Boulevard is the most dangerous of all of them. It has 12 lanes of traffic, and you can see that people want to live all around it, partly because there are four subway lines to Manhattan below it. But a few people want to live on this auto sewer. You know, traffic is supposed to flow like water, but it's more like a smelly clogged sewer pipe than a water pipe. And even the stores in the one-story taxpayers, you can see there, don't do, for it, don't do very well. So Transportation Alternatives, a nonprofit in New York City, hired us to make an alternative vision based on the photo I showed them of the Paseo de, de Gracia, actually. We added bike lanes and bus lanes, narrowed the traffic lanes, made wider landings for the people crossing the boulevard, and obviously added trees. Uh, we imagined that, this, that the taxpayer sites be, could become great transit-rich affordable housing sites. The ground view shows the same section of Queens Boulevard as the aerial view. You can see the, the one-story taxpayers in the background. Today, traffic here by the sidewalk actually goes faster than traffic in the center, which is one of the reasons why so many pedestrians die on Queens Boulevard. Here's the reimagined boulevard with slow and slower bike lanes, wider sidewalks, slow narrow car lanes along the outside, and more places for people. Yeah, the, there's the current section, uh, our proposed section with much wider sidewalks, uh, twice as wide, traffic lanes narrower and slower, etc. Um, this is a view of Lower Manhattan 100 years ago looking north on Broad Street towards Wall Street. Since 9-11, there have been a lot of restrictions on cars here. There are now 75,000 people living in the financial district, though, where there used to be fewer than 1,000. Right next door is Ground Zero, now one of the top tourist sites in America. Yet not enough tourists work their way over here. It has the old streets of New Amsterdam and the great buildings of Wall Street, and it needs help. And that, I, I should add that another thing you hear when you work in this field is, oh, but we're not Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Well, this is New Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. and, it, <laughs> and it was built by the Dutch with the same streets as old Amsterdam. So working with the Financial District Neighborhood Association, we made this plan for a slow zone for Lower Manhattan. At the top is the Brooklyn Bridge and City Hall. The, the bridge is clogged with traffic that separates City Hall and all subway stops from Wall Street. And at the bottom is New Amsterdam, Old New York, and the harbor. And this is, you, you probably know that in a year from now, um, we're going to have a congestion zone. And then you have to pay extra to get in here. And so we've officially made the decision that we want less traffic in Lower Manhattan. And so Mayor de Blasio made us part of his Green New Deal and gave, uh, gave um, FDNA, the Financial District Neighborhood Association, and the DOT a half million dollar grant for a pilot project. In this zone, cars will be welcome, but they'll have to go 15 miles per hour or slower, and there'll be no parking for longer than 30 minutes. Wayfinding maps will open the zone to pedestrians and tourists who don't know where to go after leaving ground zero. And even though as you can see when you look at this, uh, it's flanked on both sides by, it has ground zero on one side and the South Street Seaport on the other, which is another one of the biggest uh, tourist attractions in New York City. Most of the streets are already slow. You know, this, I took this, this shot on a Sunday morning so you could see it without parked cars, but it, it normally has a lot of parked cars. But most of the streets are already slow and, um, it's not, it's, if, it'd be surprising if any of them are going faster than 15 miles per hour now, except for the occasional, you know, uh, I, I'm the king driver who just ignores safety. Uh, at the end of the street is McKinmead and White's New York Municipal Building. The trees at the bottom are at the bottom, uh, the trees and the sunlight are at the bottom of the Brooklyn Bridge. And, um, if you know this area, you know that um, there's a, one of the great subway exits in New York comes up under this building in a, in a great arcade designed by McKinney and White, and you are faced by one of the worst auto sewers in New York City. 
the traffic in Brooklyn Bridge just never stops and you cannot get around and so you're, you're, you're cut off from this. So this would be the new Knickerbocker Trail between City Hall and Bowling Green. I'll, I'll show you what we're proposing for the bridge. Uh, it's similar to Boston's Freedom Trail. Um, obviously a shared space. Cars are welcome. Uh, here's Bowling Green today at, down at the other end of the trail. Uh, this is one of the oldest parts of Manhattan. Here it is with some of the lessons of Madison Square taken to the next level. You know, take back some of the street from the cars, give it to the people. It's, it's not very hard. This is the part I'm most excited about. Robert Moses demolished a lot of buildings and blocks to build all these on-ramps and off-ramps uh, to the Brooklyn Bridge. And my office actually looks out on this. And I can tell you that it's just nonstop traffic. And I'm on the 14th floor, and all day I hear honking, sirens, because the traffic here is at a standstill. And it's just people going to and from the Brooklyn Bridge and to and from the Hudson Tunnel. And we know now that um, half of them are suburbanites who could easily take the train in or the subway in or the, or the uh, path in. And another quarter of them are Uber and Lyft, which are putting taxis out of business. So three quarters of the traffic is really um, a very small number of people causing all this trouble. And it, what you can do with these on-ramps and off-ramps is you actually can take all the traffic and you can handle all the traffic going on and off the bridge and um, send them over to the east, either over to the FDR or over to Water Street and have only um, cyclists and pedestrians go through. And, you know, it's already so popular for, for cyclists and walkers that the police closed the bridge to them on New Year's Day because there were too many. Uh, even more exciting would be why not close it to cars? You know that the Hudson River has three street has three car crossings. The East River has 16, most of them free. And Lower Manhattan, um, where we're supposed to be cutting cars, has uh, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the Manhattan Bridge, which is uh, very close to the, to the Brooklyn Bridge. And you know, if we're serious about cutting cars, uh, this is not pie in the sky to say let's just take the cars off it. So after New Amsterdam, let's look at solutions from old Amsterdam and other European cities. Uh, this is an op-ed I wrote for the New York Times um, on this subject. I'm hoping to uh, write a, another book about this, the, just the lessons of Europe. Here's a street in Utrecht. You look at a street like this and you think it takes hundreds of years to make a street like this. You know, only Europe can have a street like this. Well, here's the way it looked 50 years ago in 1969. That's about the time the Dutch decided they didn't like what cars were doing to their cities and lives. And it's the same year Norman Mailer ran for mayor of New York City and proposed banning cars in Manhattan. So 50 years later, we're, we're starting to catch up. Uh, this is a new town in England with shared space streets. Uh, there it is uh, as built. Here's a street in Copenhagen that five years ago looked like this. Now it looks like this. About a third of the street has been taken from the car and uh, given back to the public realm. And last but not least, um, my last example and one of my favorites, Seven Dials is an old place in London where seven streets come together. Ten years ago, it was overrun by traffic. London removed the parking, the curbs, and the signs and made it shared space. And here's how it works today. So, thank you. So,
Are there questions? And I'll bring you the mic if there are questions, and I'll bring it back real quick. How do the European cities deal with emergency vehicles in the space they need? So they actually much better than we do because they have less traffic and so the emergency vehicles can get around. You know, live it, uh, uh, the widest truck is 11 feet wide. There is no truck wider than that and they can fit in the lanes. It's as simple as that. But, but, but the real solution is the uh, less traffic. Well, thank you so much, John. You've been fantastic. Thank you.